الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to a new series that we'll be starting today and continuing for the next uh, few days for the foreseeable future and that is a light study of selected a hadith from Riyadh Salihin by Al Hafiz Al Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala and before we delve into the study dive into it I should say uh, I want to provide an introduction introduce the topic um So today we'll begin this new series in which we'll study from a very important compilation of the Sunnah, the great work of Al Hafiz Al Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala Riyadh Al Salihin. But before beginning the study, I would like to introduce the topic by talking briefly about a few things. One, what is Sunnah? Two, the purpose and status of the Sunnah in Islam and why we must trust and have confidence in the credible collections of Sunnah. Number three, the status of Al Hafiz Al Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and number four, and finally, the reason for choosing this work. As I said, it will be a brief introduction. We'll talk about these issues, and inshallah, ta'ala, tomorrow we'll take up our first hadith. So, what is Sunnah? For the purpose of our study, what is intended by Sunnah is ما ثبت عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من قول أو فعل أو إقرار أو صفة خلقية كانت أو خلقية. So for the purpose of our study, what we intend by a sunnah is what can be attributed to the Prophet with great or complete certainty, whether statement, action, tacit approval, or a description of his appearance or his character. Now the next point is the one that really is, I guess, the main uh, issue that's going to you know, we're going to spend a lot of time on. And that is, what is the purpose of the Sunnah? What is the purpose of the Sunnah in Islam, and why must we trust and have confidence in the credible collections of Sunnah? Brothers and sisters, from the time of the Prophet وسلم, and down through the centuries, the Sunnah of our beloved Prophet وسلم, has been held in the highest esteem. The early scholars would travel far and wide for a single, brothers and sisters, for a single hadith. And they actively sought the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ in every matter of importance and encouraged their students and followers to do so as well. Anything that had to do with life, particularly if it had to do with worship, but even if just daily affairs, they wanted to know how did the Prophet eat? How did he sleep? How did he drink? How did he stand? How did he walk? How did he talk? They wanted to know these things which were not necessarily related to worship. But they were actively trying to find out how the Prophet did these things, which could be considered mundane, considered something which are issues of personal choice. And they would actively seek the knowledge of these things so that they could imitate and emulate the Prophet. So they always, they also, in addition to this, they always gave precedence to the Sunnah of the Prophet over their own opinions and those of others, no matter how knowledgeable. To the point that the four Imams, Rahimahumullah Ta'ala, uh, Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, and Ahmad, these four Imams have all been quoted as saying in one form or another, in one form or another. In Sahih al Hadithu, Fahuwa Madhabi. Aw, in Wajatta Hadithan, Yuhali Fu Kauli, Fadrib Bi Kauli Ard, Ard al Hayat. If the Hadith is authentic, then that is my Madhab. Or, If you find a hadith which contradicts my opinion, take my opinion and throw it against the wall. Only relatively. Now, so we talked about how the early scholars, the early imams were very keen to follow the sunnah. And the ummah in general, they held the sunnah of the Prophet in the highest esteem. When the Prophet spoke, people listened. People got quiet. They listened attentively and they tried to implement it. This is how it was in the early period. But recently, only relatively recently, have Muslims begun to question the authority of the Sunnah and doubt the credibility of the Prophet's ahadith and give precedence to personal opinions over the prophetic traditions. Only recently have we seen this level of disrespect for the Sunnah, this questioning of the authenticity of the Sunnah and whether or not we're even obligated to follow the Prophet and obey him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now time does not permit us to delve too deeply into this issue. 
but I would like to say a few words aimed at dispelling the most common misconceptions. I'm going to mention four misconceptions and four responses to those misconceptions. The first one is that people will commonly claim that the only wahi that the Prophet received, the only revelation the Prophet received was the Qur'an. That's the only revelation he received. But the fact of the matter is that Allah definitely revealed things to the Prophet which are not mentioned, not contained in the Qur'an. And the Qur'an itself indicates that there was a wahi, a revelation that the Prophet received that is not contained in the Qur'an. And those revelations not contained in the Qur'an are what? Are from his sunnah. They're not the totality of his sunnah, but they are from his sunnah. And they are just as binding as the revelations contained in the Qur'an. What's the proof? I'll give you two ayat, although there are a number of them we can mention in the Qur'an, where Allah is informing us that he speaks to the Prophet and reveals to him revelations which are not contained in the Qur'an. First of all, take the ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 143, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah says, And we did not appoint the Qibla to which you previously faced, except that we might distinguish the people who follow the Messenger from those who turn back on their heels. Now pay attention, brothers and sisters. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that or he's talking about, or this is in the context, these ayat in the context of the changing of the qibla from when the Muslims faced Bayt al-Maqdis in prayer to when they faced, they began to face al-Ka'bah in prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the first qibla, Bayt al-Maqdis, He's saying he appointed it. He says, we, meaning Allah, did not appoint the Qibla to which you previously faced, except that we might distinguish the people who follow the messenger from those who turn back on their heels. Allah mentions that he was the one who appointed the first Qibla, told the Ummah to face Bayt al-Maqdis. And that he did this to see who would follow the messenger. But there's no verse in the Qur'an where Allah assigns Bayt al-Maqdis as the Qibla. He designates Bayt al-Maqdis as the Qibla. So when Allah says, we appoint the Qibla, it's not in the Qur'an. It means that He revealed to the Prophet to face the Qibla and the Prophet told the Ummah. And Allah treated the Prophet telling them as if He had told them Himself. Not only that, He says that He did it this way. He didn't reveal in the Qur'an. He told to the Prophet and the Prophet told the Ummah and he expected them to follow it. And he did this to see who would follow the Prophet and who would turn back on his heels. That's one example. I'll give you one more example, but I hope that, that became, that's clear. That obviously Allah did not reveal. You can read the Qur'an from cover to cover. You will not find an ayah where Allah designates Bayt al-Maqdis as the original Qibla. But he says that he did, that he designated it. So if he designated it, who communicated to the Ummah so that they would do it? It had to be the Messenger. But Allah is saying He revealed it. He designated it, which means He must have told the Prophet to tell them, and He treats it as if He told them Himself. Like number two, from another proof along these lines that the, uh, the Prophet receives revelation, is the ayah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, what in Surah Al-Imran, the third surah, I'm sorry, Surah, surah Al-Anfal, the eighth surah, verse number seven, He says, and when Allah promised you all, meaning the companions, Ashab Rasulullah, that one of the two groups would fall into your hands. Now this, these ayat are in the context of, of uh, the Battle of Badr, which was sparked by the fact that the Prophet and his companions came out with the intention of seizing a caravan belonging to Quraysh returning from Syria. So it was their intention to go out and what? And to seize this caravan. But at the same time, there was what? There was an army coming to what? To rescue the caravan and to instigate a war with the Prophet and the Muslims. So Allah says, and when Allah promised you all that one of the two groups, meaning either the caravan or the army instigating war would fall into your hands. You Muslims would face off with one of these two groups, the caravan or the impending army. Allah is saying He promised. Allah is saying that He promised. But there's no verse in the Quran 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the Muslims that one of those two groups would fall into their hands. But Allah is saying that He promised. But the promise didn't come from Allah in the Qur'an. It came from the Prophet in his sunnah, his communications directly with the companions. Which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this to the Prophet. And the Prophet spoke about it in his sunnah. The Prophet spoke to them in his own words. It didn't come in the Qur'an. And Allah treated it as if he himself had said it. These are two proofs from many brothers and sisters. That there was a revelation. There was a dialogue between Allah and the Messenger. The Prophet received revelations from Allah that are not included in the Qur'an. That's the first shubha, and it's been refuted by two ayat, although we could give many more. The second shubha, the second misconception, is that Allah ordered the mess is that we have only been ordered to obey Allah. We're only required to obey Allah. Right? But the response to that is that Allah ordered that the Messenger of Allah be obeyed. And He made the obeying of the Messenger tantamount to obeying Allah Himself. Allah says, and there are many ayat with this meaning, but we'll give one from Surah An-Nisa, verse number 80. He says, وَمَن يُطِعَ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ الله. Whoever obeys the Messenger has thereby obeyed Allah. And in other words, whoever doesn't obey the Messenger has not obeyed Allah. So people say that we're only required to obey Allah. Allah is ordering us to obey the Messenger. And if we don't obey the Messenger, we have not obeyed Allah. So that's one response. The second response is, if the sunnah is not credible, if we say, oh, the sunnah is not credible, you can't trust the sunnah, none of these hadith can be trusted, if we say that, then Allah, would, then Allah by asking us or ordering us to obey the Prophet would be asking us or ordering us to do something which is impossible. When Allah says obey the Prophet and all the hadith are not credible, how can we obey the Prophet? We have nothing from him, we have no commands from him, no tradition from him to follow. And so therefore Allah is ordering us to do something which is impossible. And Allah says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not burden a soul with that which he cannot bear. Allah doesn't ask us to do anything which is impossible. So what that means is what he's ordered us to do is possible. The sunnah has been preserved. But another uh, shubha is that, um, is that the Qur'an is sufficient and we can take the Qur'an and follow the Qur'an. There's no need for the sunnah. But the fact of the matter, brothers and sisters, to respond to this shubha is that the Qur'an requires proper interpretation and practical, um, sorry, and practical implementation. Proper interpretation, practical implementation. And this cannot be achieved except by the way of the Prophet who performs these and other functions vis-a-vis -vis the Qur'an through his sunnah. So who is going to interpret the Qur'an for us and make sure we understand it correctly? Who is going to implement it and show us how it's done? The Prophet ﷺ. How? Through his sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, just to show this, just to demonstrate this from the Qur'an itself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا, مَا, مَا نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And we have revealed the reminder to you so that you would clarify, O Muhammad, to the people what has been revealed to them. Another ayah along these lines, but with more um, detail, is the ayah from Surah Al-Imran, the third surah, verse 164, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah subhanahu wa So the first ayah, and we revealed the reminder to you, so that you would clarify to the people what has been revealed to them. The second ayah from Surah Al-Imran, Allah has indeed blessed the believers with His favor when He raised in their midst a messenger from among themselves who recites to them His verses, purifies them, teaches them the book and the wisdom while they were previously in manifest error. Now these verses, these two verses, they indicate that the Prophet has the following responsibilities. He has the following responsibility. He was sent to do some jobs. What are those jobs? The first one, to recite the book as revealed to him. Allah reveals the Qur'an and the Prophet has to recite it to us, to convey it to us, to tell us what Allah said verbatim, without making any changes. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to the Prophet, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Right? All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. The Prophet can't say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Makhluqeen. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Makhluqat. Alhamdulillah Rabbi Al-Khalq. The Prophet can't say, Praise be to Allah, 
the Lord of the created things. The Lord of creation. No, he has to say Rabbil Alameen because that's what Allah said. That's one of his jobs is to convey to us the Quran verbatim, the way Allah revealed to him. Number two from his jobs, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is to teach the book and clarify its meanings. Teaching is not the same as reciting. The Prophet beyond, he's not supposed to just bring like a postman. He brings a letter and walks away. He brings the letter and he leaves. And it's up to us to read it and to interpret it and to try to figure out what it means and how it's supposed to be understood. No. The Prophet's job is beyond just telling us what Allah said verbatim. He has to teach us the book and he has to clarify its meanings. He has to interpret it for us. That's another responsibility of the Prophet. He is the final authority when it comes to interpreting what Allah intends by the words he revealed, the words he spoke. Number three from the duties of the Prophet is to see, to teach something besides or alongside the book. Because Allah said, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ He teaches them the book وَالْحِكْمَةِ and the hikmah. This wow in the Arabic language, to feed al-mughayra. The benefit of saying al-kitaba wal-hikmah, the book and the wisdom in Arabic, when you say and, it means that the book is one thing, wisdom is something else. They are not the same thing. And the scholars of tafsir have clarified what is this wisdom that the Prophet is supposed to teach. Ibn Kathir and other scholars of tafsir have said the wisdom is the sunnah. The wisdom is what? His teach, his, his interpretations, his practice, his implementation, right? And other things that are not included in the Qur'an. So the Prophet is obligated, brothers and sisters, by this verse, giving him these responsibilities to teach the sunnah. And we are obligated to follow the sunnah. Because what is the benefit of Allah obligating the Prophet to teach the wisdom, to teach the sunnah, if we're not obligated to what? to benefit from those teachings, to take those teachings and to try to embody them. The last responsibility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in these ayat is to purify the people by providing them with a practical way of life. That if they implement it, will improve their condition, make them better, use a key him. It will what? It will improve them, it will better them, it will purify them. And obviously this function is something additional to what? To reciting and to teaching the book and the wisdom. He has to what? He has to give them a practical way of life. How can these functions, brothers and sisters, be fulfilled after the Prophet's death? How can the Prophet recite to us? How can the Prophet ﷺ teach us the book, teach us the wisdom? How can he purify us except if his sunnah has been authentically narrated and credibly preserved? So we can what? We can consult the sunnah to be taught the book. We can consult the sunnah to have the book interpreted for us by the Prophet ﷺ. We can consult the Sunnah to find out what is the wisdom. What is the wisdom? How do we live an Islamic life and how do we become purified by leading that life, etc. Lastly from the Shubuhat is that you have, or misconceptions, that you have people who they are normal people like you and me. And they'll go to the books of Sunnah and they'll say, how can, they'll think to themselves, they'll say, how can we be sure that this person heard what the Prophet said, memorized it, and didn't relate it incorrectly? That the Prophet actually said A and he said B. Or, you know, the Prophet said this and he said that. How can we be certain that these people didn't make a mistake, that their memories were not um, faulty, that their, that their memory didn't serve them correctly and they basically, not intentionally, but they said things and attributed them to the Prophet that the Prophet didn't actually say. That's, what, that's another shubha that's common. What we say to that is that when it comes to any issue related to any science or discipline, the deference is always given to the experts. The final say on the issue related to that particular science or discipline is always given to the experts, the specialists of that discipline. If it were medicine and we were trying to figure out who should have the final say. So for example, should we wear masks to prevent the spread of COVID-19 or not wear masks? A person, you know, who remain nameless who is a political figure, 
He is a public servant. He is an elected official. He says, masks, I don't, I don't see the benefit in wearing masks. I don't see how that's going to prevent the spread. A doctor comes, a specialist in disease control comes and says that wearing a mask will prevent the spread of COVID-19. We all do what? We give deference to the doctor, to the specialist. We say he knows and he doesn't, this person doesn't know. They're not a specialist in this field. This person says, the person who's elected official, for example, who remain nameless, says drink disinfectants, right? And that will help cure your body from COVID-19. And the, the specialist, the doctor, the specialist in disease control says don't do that, that will kill you. We all give precedence to what? To the doctor, to the specialist. That being said, brothers and sisters, the specialist, we don't give deference to the layman, we don't give deference to the casual enthusiast when it comes to what? These types of things. Whenever it's a special science, we give deference, we give preferential treatment, we make the final say on that issue or those issues, we give it to what? To the specialist. If that's the case, brothers and sisters, the experts and specialists in the science of hadith and the scholars of Islam, um, and generally, have unanimously agreed throughout the centuries and up until the current era that the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad is credible and trustworthy and a primary source of Islamic teachings and law. These are the experts saying you can trust the Sunnah. These credible collections of Sunnah you can trust them, you can take from them, and they are, you can have confidence that the, that the Prophet spoke these words. He did these actions. He approved of these things. These are his descriptions, whether related to his, his appearance or his character. These experts are telling, the, telling us this. How can we give deference to experts in other fields, but the experts in the field of Islam generally, and Hadith specifically, we don't give deference to them. So these are four Shubuhat brothers and these are the four and sisters, and these are the four answers to those Shubuhat. And the next point that we want to mention in the introduction was the status of Al-Habal Nawi, Rahimullah Ta'ala. A Nawi, Rahimullah Ta'ala, is unanimously regarded as one of the greatest scholars Islam has ever known. He was an expert in the fields of Hadith terminology, Sunnah, Islamic jurisprudence, and language and linguistics. He is also considered a leading authority of the Shafi'i school of juristic thought. So he's a great scholar, skilled and masterful in several different disciplines. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why his book, Riyadh al-Salaheen, became such a widely accepted piece of work because of his pedigree. Which brings us to the last point, the reason for choosing this work. A Noe's work, Riyadh al-Salaheen, is universally regarded as one of the most divinely favored muwaffaq compilations of the Sunnah. The Islamic world has ever seen one of the most highly regarded, most divinely favored muwaffaq compilations of Sunnah that the world has ever seen. The Muslims, irrespective of their various languages, nationalities, sectarian loyalties, and theological, and theological schools, have all embraced this work they teach from it and recommend it for study. You know, brothers and sisters, the Muslims love to differ about stuff. And each group and sect has what? Has their body of what? Literature, their canon. And these are the books that we teach from, these are the books we study, these are the books we recommend for study, etc. And we always talk bad about the books of the other groups. But this book, regardless of the group, regardless of the sect, regardless of the ideology, everyone accepts the al Salihin. They respect it. They consider it a credible work of Sunnah. They read from it themselves and they teach it to their students. This book is an excellent source, brothers and sisters. It's an excellent resource. And no masjid or home library should be, should be without a copy. The book is highly comprehensive, which is one of the, another quality that makes it um, widely accepted and widely read, studied, and taught. And it focuses on the most important narrations from the Sunnah that strengthen and increase faith, enhance our relationship with Allah, aid in the achievement of sincerity in worship, help us to achieve an ikhlas, plant and nurture the seeds of loving and revering the Prophet Sallallahu in the heart of every Muslim, and increase our desire to follow him and hold fast to his sunnah. The book also addresses purification of the soul, cleansing the heart and treating its illnesses as well as providing encouragement toward the performance of righteous deeds 
and a deterrent from the commission of evil deeds. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, given the blessed nature of this book, to bless our study of it. To make us from those who benefit from these ahadith, from the compilation of sunnah that this half of this great scholar has uh, compiled and amassed. To take the lessons from them and to be from the people who implement those lessons in our life and become better and achieve one of the uh, objectives of the Prophet Sallallahu by being sent and that is we use a key him, that we become purified, we become better uh, that we, when we finish this study we become better Muslims than we were when we started Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen Wa Sallallahu Wa Sallam Wa Baraka Nabi Muhammad Wa Ala Ali Wa Sahib